Unit 10, Gases and Kinetic Molecular Theory, Ms. Howard's Chemistry Class, Borker High School Chemistry, Part 3. The state of Texas says you need to describe and calculate the relationship between volume, pressure, number of moles, temperature for an ideal gas. You need to perform stoichiometric calculations involving volume and mass. You need to describe the parts of the phonetic molecular theory, and you need to understand energy and its various forms. So we've already talked about A, Avogadro's Law, B, Boyle's Law, and now we're moving on to C, Charles' Law. Charles' Law was created somewhere around 1787, and it relates volume and temperature. So if you have a constant pressure, that means the pressure's not changing. When the volume goes up, the temperature goes up. So V1, V initial, over T1 equals V2, V final, over T2. The 1 and 2 again refer to the starting and final temperatures and volumes. And there's a lovely picture of Charles. So I have a couple of videos in here, and let's see if they will play. This first is actually created by a middle school. As you can see, the ball can fit through the ring, but when we use a torch to heat it up, the ball can't fit through it anymore. When you heat up items, the atoms move faster and need more space. What would happen if we put the ball into a glass of cold water? As you can see, the ball can fit through the ring. If you put liquid nitrogen on a balloon, the atoms move slower, need less space, and this is called contraction. When the warmer atoms from the ground and air hit the balloon, the atoms inside the balloon heat up and they expand. Awesome. So we have a really fun example of atoms expanding, gas molecules expanding when they're um, heated. So the volume increases when the temperature increases. Okay, the next one, we also have a really great demonstration at a college level. So let's see if we can get this one to play. Like that, let's do that on Monday night, too. Accumulate as much gas as we can in the light. And I don't want it flowing. If it does fall, make it reach towards you. Oh, yeah. Everybody notice we do have light protection on the table. Yes. Do you want to? Look at that. Get a shot of that. Get a shot of that. It's just jumping up and down. Building the suspense. Yeah, yeah, I tried to adjust you, right? Oh, yeah, I've got a half a minute. I'm going to tighten that thing up. What do we think? We voted yeah, all the air down? I'm, yeah. I'm voting, man. Yeah. 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 Do a brief. Yeah, yeah. do a brief. Yeah. 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 Now when I get, I'm going to dump some ice on here. When I do, everybody be real quiet. If you're quiet, you can actually hear the water condensing inside of it and raining down inside. Oh, nice. Yes. Okay.
amazing. So basically what happened is you had all the air when you uh, heated the, you put water in there and all the air was, uh, um, okay, let me backtrack. You put some water in there and you boiled the water so you changed the steam. And the steam, the gaseous water, pushed all the air up and out because the air was lighter than the steam. So once they turned off the fire and capped it so no air could rush back in, when they put ice on the top, all that steam turned back into liquid and it took up less pressure. It took up less volume. So now you have a lot of volume with no molecules in it. And you had very little pressure. So you had greater air pressure outside the drum than inside. And the air pressure, just the normal air pressure that you're sitting in right now, crushed that big, huge 55-gallon drum. Okay, so we're ready for letter D, the fourth law, Dalton's Law of Partial Pressures. The pressure of each different type of a gas in a mixture, like in air, is called a partial pressure. The total pressure for a mix of gases is equal to the sum of the partial pressures. So we have nitrogen in the air, we have oxygen in the air. The pressure of the nitrogen plus the pressure of the oxygen will add up to the total pressure of the atmosphere here. So pressure total is equal to the pressure of 1 plus the pressure of 2 plus the pressure of 3 plus however many pressures of gases there are in there. Okay, so we have Dalton's Law of Partial Air Pressure here. And you notice we've got the Earth, and there's you. You're very, very big. And we have lots of different gases. So if you have 149 millimeters of mercury of pressure for the oxygen, and then you have 590 millimeters of mercury pressure for the nitrogen, and you see all the little 8 millimeters for phosphor or uh, argon and 3 millimeters for CO2, the total air pressure is equal to all those air pressures added up together. So the, four, the fifth one is Gay-Lussac's Law. Yes, it is Gay-Lussac. And it created in about 1802. It relates pressure and temperature. So in this case, we're going to keep a constant volume. The volume doesn't change. We're going to keep constant volume. And we're going to see what happens to the pressure and the temperature. So in this case, when the pressure goes up, the temperature goes up. And the next one on here is the Combined Gas Law. And this one is really the one that's most useful because we're actually combining Boyle's Law, Charles' Law, and Gay-Lussac's Law. So we're combining the pressure, the volume, and the temperature. And we get a combined gas law, and it's the one that it's most easily used. And this can actually be used even when you don't have one of them fixed, one of them that doesn't change. So what we have is an equation that looks like this. Pressure initial times the volume initial divided by the temperature initial is equal to the final pressure times the final volume divided by the final temperature. And so you have the combined gas law. And the next one we're looking at is the ideal gas law. And in this case, the ideal gas law takes into account the number of moles also. So again, we have the pressure, P, the volume, V. The N is the number of moles, and T is temperature. And then you have that R. And the R is called the ideal gas constant. And which R you use is determined by which type of pressure unit you're using. If you're using one atmosphere, you use a particular R. If you're using um, millimeters of mercury or pascals, you use different R's. And so you have to kind of look those up on a chart. So N is the number of moles. R is the ideal gas constant. P is pressure. V is the volume in liters. It has to be in liters. And T is the temperature in Kelvin. No negative numbers here. It's in Kelvin. And we will work some problems, children. Now, again, which R you use depends on which units of pressure in and they're measuring. In your chemistry book, it's on page 342. They've got it listed. I also have this listed in your notes. So R could be 62.4 if you're using millimeters of mercury. And I didn't put in the units of measurement with the R's. I just uh, kept it a little cleaned up and simple here. And so you can see what's going on here if uh, you have different units of measurement for atmosphere for pressure, then you have different R's that you use. And we have one more video that you're going to see, and this one's really pretty amazing. So let's hopefully this is going to work, too. It's about five minutes. This region may hold the key to the future of our climate as global warming takes hold. It's one of the remotest and coldest places on the planet. For much of the year, temperatures fall to minus 40 degrees Celsius, freezing everything solid including the ground. 
but hidden in this frozen ground, known as permafrost, is a potential climate disaster. It's called methane, and it's a far more powerful greenhouse gas than carbon dioxide. The danger is, if the permafrost was to melt as a result of global warming, it could release methane on a massive scale. Ecologist Katie Walter believes that it's already beginning to happen. She's studying the lakes that cover the region. The permafrost contains a very large pool of organic carbon. It's dead plant matter. And that dead plant matter, when it is thawed out in the bottoms of the lakes, it's a food source for organisms that produce methane. They eat the dead plant matter and they burp out methane. Methane is the byproduct of their digestion. And it bubbles up from the lake sediments and gets trapped in the ice. If Katie is right, then the ice should be full of bubbles of methane. To find out the extent of the problem, Katie and an assistant head out onto the middle of the frozen lake. First, they remove the snow covering the ice. before using tea from their flask to clear the surface. You can actually see the bubbles trapped in the ice. They're beautiful. The ice can be crystal clear with little bubbles, almost like coins, stacked on top of one another. And what's happening is that as the bubbles are released from the sediments beneath, they wobble up through the water column and they hit the ice that's forming and thickening overhead. And so the bubbles actually freeze in place. The trouble is, if these are bubbles of methane, it won't stay trapped in the ice for long. When the ice thaws in spring, the gas will escape. There's one sure way to check just how much methane is in these bubbles, because it's highly flammable. When you poke a hole into those uh, pillows of methane, you get this stream of gas that comes out and depending on the size of your hole you can get a very large stream of gas so when you light that you get a very large flame and you have to be careful because sometimes you can singe your eyebrows Whoa. <laughs> these bubbles can be found all over the place there must be enormous amounts of methane being released here and that has serious implications. The methane then heats the atmosphere, contributing to global warming, which then causes more permafrost to melt and more methane to be produced, and it's sort of this vicious feedback cycle. We think of this permafrost here like as a time bomb waiting to go off. That is just pretty amazing that the 